way in which we can continue to have participate in our programs, but in a way that is cognizant and aware and respectful of what's happening um, in our environment today. So I'm going to quickly turn this over to Jay Sebelius, who will uh, introduce the folks who will be presenting today. Thank you so much for uh, being here today, Jay and team. Thank you so much, Margarita. I really appreciate that introduction. Today we have a uh, Again, I'm Jay Sebelius. I'm Associate Professor at CAPS. I'm really, really proud to be uh, co-presenting this town hall with my team who has really led this effort and uh, really designed this town hall. And so just as a brief overview, I'm going to kind of set the stage, um, introduce our team, and then we're going to um, have a couple presenters from my team and then a bit of a panel discussion with our team members, leaving time for question and answer at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so uh, we can get started. So uh, this is a, a, a picture of our amazing team. We recently wrote a letter of uh, 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 notes from the field uh, for the uh, AIDS and behavior series around uh, conducting research during COVID-19. And what we saw missing was really a discussion about um, not only how difficult it is to do research during the COVID-19 pandemic, but really how um, structural issues that we've always had in being able to serve all of our participants have been exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we wrote this article um, as a team um, based on our field uh, observations. And so we will talk um, a little bit about that article, but also kind of broaden it out. Um, so this is a, just a snapshot of, um, of the article. And in it, we talk about how COVID-19 has exacerbated existing health disparities, um, different forms of marginalization in the communities that we work with, and really reveals um, racist policies and practices um, throughout our institutions, uh, UCSF being part of that, that institutional, uh, perpetuating that institutional racism and really recognizing that research institutions are not inherently designed to truly benefit black and trans communities and other marginalized communities that we are really trying hard to reach um, with our research programs. And we wanted to take a moment to reflect upon this particular moment in time. Just in the past week alone, within the context of COVID-19, within this shelter in place, within the health disparities that have been exacerbated by this pandemic, we have seen um, a tremendous um, uprising against police brutality and systemic racism around the world. And this not only affects us personally as a team, but also illuminates racist policies and practices um, in, in every institution, not just in police systems, but in academia, um, in, in all of our institutions that really have as their foundation white supremacist ideologies. And within this past week, again, you know, Trump, the Trump administration erased transgender civil rights protection in healthcare, which was a huge blow. Uh, to our communities. And then right, um, right after that, we had this um, tremendous um, protests where people were showing up for um, Black trans people in protests. And then we had two Black trans women who were killed within the past week, right around the same time that Trump is revoking um, discrimination protections in healthcare. This is also within the same week, Juneteenth is this week. Um, where you know we, we're really trying to um, call attention to the fact that Juneteenth is not yet a national holiday, um, and there have been been a lot of movements to try and recognize that. Um, and then on the tail end of all of this, we have civil rights protections um, that have passed for uh, LGBT workers in the Supreme Court, which is a great victory. So we're on a bit of a, a emotional roller coaster, <laughs> um, and we also have this a tremendous opportunity for real change. Um, we, people are awake, people are mobilized, and we really want to take this moment to broaden um, our discussion today beyond just conducting research in the context of, of COVID-19, but conducting research in this moment where we have an opportunity to really reflect on our practices and policies that perpetuate some of these systemic inequities. 
And now I have the honor of introducing my incredible team. Maybe you could each just kind of wave from your Hollywood square when I say your name. Uh, Akira Jackson, our fabulous research assistant and project coordinator for Healthy Divas and It Takes Two. Uh, these are our projects at the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health with the logos uh, on the left side here. Ariana Salinas, who is our peer health educator from Triunfo. Aziza Go, uh, our phlebotomist and research assistant from Healthy Divas and It Takes Two. Brianna McCree, a peer counselor and intervention specialist for Healthy Divas and It Takes Two, who's also working with us on um, the PRC core research project um, where we are um, helping CalPAP translate Healthy Divas. Carla Kleins, who is a, a recruiter and research assistant for Healthy Divas and It Takes Two. Luis Gutierrez Mock, project director for Triumph Triumfo. Uh, Luz Venegas, a research assistant for Triunfo and also for Sofia Zamudio Haas's uh, RAP. Uh, Ellen Stein, who is a project director for It Takes Two. Sofia Zamudio Haas, project director for Healthy Divas and Girlfriends Connect, and a principal investigator for RAP Project. And then me, Jay Savellius, I am principal investigator for the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health for um, our community based research projects. So do we have uh, Carla Kleins in the house? I haven't seen her yet. Okay. Well, oh, do you, oh, there you are, Carla. Yes. So uh, we're gonna have uh, Carla Kleins um, talk about some of the challenges and possible solutions to some of the, um, the issues that we raised in the article that we wrote for AIDS and Behavior. And she's really speaking from her experience uh, helping to implement Healthy Divas and It Takes Two. Hi, everyone. Thank you to be here in this presentation. Um, we, we are very excited to have the opportunity to show this to the world. So uh, there have been uh, many challenges in this, in this uh, pandemic situation in the way that we do our, our work. So talking about technology, there's been many challenges because our clients, you know, they are from the marginalized uh, communities and uh, they don't have access to the technology. They don't have um, the phones that, that they can get soon, or they don't have, um, they have Obama phone that is no has all the future that other phones has. So it has been a, a lot of challenge and specific for the language too has been another challenge to deal with it with the Spanish speaking people. Uh, so uh, the, the biggest challenge that we have been facing is the reimbursement to the participants. After they do finish the session, we have to give them the incentive, mm -hmm. what we usually do. So we have been trying many ways to satisfy this need because we consider that the people, they really need to the money after they finish the interview is very important. So. Uh, the reimbursement has been a, a problem. We, ha we have different options that we keep in getting and we're getting feedback from our, our clients and they tell us like possible new ways to send money to them. So we have been using the option to send the cash over the mail. We have the option to get, send them a gift card for, from Amazon. And, um, and also we have the chance to send them a uh, through to the applications, to the virtual applications like uh, Cash App or, or a Venmo. But the problem is that many of our clients, they don't even have a checking account. They don't even have anything under their name. So it's gonna be, it's very hard. They don't even have money right now to pay the internet. So those are kind of many, many of the challenges that we have been facing. So basically what we have been doing is the majority of our clients has been decided they want money in cash and we send it to the mail. But we have an experiment that we have been lost in some of the money that we send, some of the mail that we never arrives to the, to the people. And, and they have been calling us to kind of complain and very, very upset because they really want the money. So in that case, what we do is, you know, let them know that it's not in our hands, that it's nothing that we can control. And, um, and if they don't get the money, we can reimburse them again. Yeah, so 
so basically is what I have to say. So uh, there's possible solutions that we have, and um, we are doing our inter our surveys over the internet, over the uh, and via phone call. Uh, we have the telehealth delivery of interventions, the community capacity building to use the technology, like people maybe they can access to another agency that they may let them use the, the computer, and uh, resource mapping and dissemination and referrals. Trauma and foreign peer support is very important in this case. And instrumental support and administrative support is very important because even when we try to find uh, solutions to make uh, to get the money faster to these clients, uh, sometimes we cannot use some of the applications because the administration system don't allow us to use such applications like in case of the cash out appointment. So we try to do our best and we try to kind of uh, work together with the, with the administrative support of the university. And, um, and, I hope, and, and I hope they give us access to another page that we cannot have access, like a Facebook, for example. And uh, just as, as, as a fast sample that I'm going to tell you is uh, from six participants that we have on, um, on the Healthy Divas, and 21 partners that we have on T2 is a total of 27 people. The majority of them, they don't want, uh, they don't want to wait until we we open the doors again for have a direct intervention. So they don't want even even a Amazon gift card. Only one person from the from the T story decided that they want the Amazon card. So and most of the people wants. Uh, cash over the mail. Uh, we have uh, is 13 people, so it's kind of the, the majority that they decide to have that. And some of them, they, have, they want the cash, the cash up upon me. So it has been hard because they don't know how to use the, the application, so they need to learn how to use the application, download it. So that we, what we're doing is sometimes we have to, to do the session with them and, and walk, walk them through all this process that they have to do and feel of that, help them to feel the the applications for them to have access to this application. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carla. And now we have uh, Luis Gutierrez Mac who will talk about uh, Grupo Virtual and how the Triunfo study has been able to serve their participants during um, the shelter in place. Thanks. I'm just going to actually start with Luz and then transition to me in the middle. Great. So, Luz Venegas. Hi everyone, I am Luz. Um, our first, okay, so we are part of Triunfo, a trans-Latina prep demonstration project at La Clinica de Raza's Oakland location. Slide. Um, so some, we wanna talk about some of our pre-coronavirus plans, uh, which were to end data, end data collection in early May of 2020. Uh, staff members uh, scheduled for gender affirming surgeries in May. Intervention staff layoffs were to begin in May, one person through August. Coronavirus changes. Um, ended all parent study data collection on March 9th, 2020. Uh, all gender affirming surgeries were canceled. Layoff of staff in a pandemic. Pivoted to individual phone navigation support. Launched, we started launching virtual groups um, and thus did ethnographic observations. Slide. Uh, so, one of the things when we were doing these uh, on Fridays, we host um, uh, uh, support groups. Um, and one of the great things about this is that we get an inter intimate look at people's lives. Some join from work, their car. Um, while they're cooking or doing their hair, some get dressed up, which really shows a, a wide divide in a uh, range of the ways people are showing up and participating in these uh, weekly Friday groups from five to seven and then sometimes five to six. Slide. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the things that we've, uh, information we've been gathering from these um, virtual groups are, um, there have been about 10 Spanish language Zoom groups uh, with trans Latinas, um, an average of 18 participants for group, ranging from eight to 37. 
um, an average of five staff or presenters. Uh, these include community members or people that have access to resources for the communities we're working with. There's about 29 virtual staff meetings that have taken place from the moment we started, which was April 1st to um, last week. Um, some of the group topics have um, gone from anywhere from COVID-19 resources to coping with shelter in place, self-care, sex uh, work harm reduction, supporting each other during this time, and just creating a space where people um, can come and stay. Slide. Thanks, Luz. And so some of the findings that we have um, from this, this ethnographic study, and this is you know, not part of our overall parent study, and it was really a, a response not to being able to capture data in our communities, but to be able to support the communities who participate in our research. So we have challenges and successes. It's been, it was very difficult to get our folks to use Zoom. It took individual level support from our intervention staff to each and every single one of our participants. Um, and then, you know, the internet connection, we can do nothing about, but we were able to get um, almost everybody to be able to use Zoom. There's just a few people who haven't been able to use Zoom and we've been trying to support them and just calling in if they're able to. And if not, then we do individual calls with them. Um, Trans-specific health impacts. So not just our staff, but also some of our participants had their surgeries canceled. And so all like non-essential surgeries got canceled, which included gender affirming surgeries as part of COVID-19. Um, all of our participants also who were getting hormones injected in the clinic by a clinician had to rapidly shift to self-injection. And that self-injection is just, it's not very fun for people who don't like to stick a needle inside of themselves. Uh, that there's really been a failure of public health messaging support and response, um, that our participants are really talking about a lack of knowledge, lack of information. They don't understand adequately the impact of coronavirus. They are not supported to be able to shift their behaviors in ways that we all need to change our behaviors. Uh, we found that fatalism was very common amongst our participants. And then there's just really an extreme lack of resources, even in the funding that's been created for LGBT populations. It wasn't in Spanish. Nothing has been in Spanish. And so our staff have had to go and provide that individual support to help all of our participants in applying for funding because they had to translate it. And also our folks don't really use computers like that. They don't apply for things like that. And then within all of this, as we're trying to wrap our study and laying off our study staff in the midst of a pandemic where you know, trans communities are being particularly um, impacted in ways that other communities are not, um, there's an increased demand on our staff. So uh, again, we've been assisting with applications for relief funds. We've been organizing grocery delivery because again, those support services for delivery, uh, grocery delivery are in English and not in Spanish. Um, scheduling prep and clinic appointments, and then just this huge need for social support. Next slide, please. So we've been talking about how to show up for our communities. And I, th I think the biggest thing uh, for us is that we have an obligation to our communities. And I wanna extend that to all of us who work in research and to all of us who are doing research within marginalized populations, that we absolutely have an obligation to the communities in which we are doing our research right now as everyone is struggling so much. Um, our, our staff is really engaging in a lot of this work in unpaid time because this is our community and it's, you know, we can't watch our communities not being able to afford food, not being able to afford their basic needs and seeing how impacted their lives are. Um, we co-organized a fund with Taja's Coalition, Akira Jackson is the executive director, to provide 43 trans women, mostly uh, trans Latinas, mostly undocumented, with $210 each. And just really taking this, um, showing up for our communities very, very seriously. Next slide, please. And I think that ways that all of you can help us to do this is by redistributing your income. For those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to have income right now, if we are able to afford more beyond our basic needs, I, you know, I'm just gonna go ahead and say, I'm judging you if you're not redistributing your income. You know, I don't know how helpful that is with behavior change, probably not, but just to share. <laughs> um, if you wanna support our folks directly, um, you can just Venmo me. We are, you know, we are directly supporting people with their grocery needs. 
Um, so beyond what we can get, if, if we are unable to obtain groceries on days that there are, is a grocery um, available within the county, we go there, we, we provide groceries to those folks. And there are also people who have needs, you know, like people need meat. There's not meat being given away in those free groceries. And then also Taja's Coalition has a uh, GoFundMe that is up now if you want to have a um, tax deduction for your donation. Thank you so much, Luis. And uh, before we launch into our panel discussion, um, Rochelle, I wonder if you could launch the first poll for our audience. We have a, an interactive question for folks. This is entirely anonymous, but we wanted to kind of bring it back to, do I need to stop my share? Oh, it's fine. Okay. Um, we we kind of wanted to bring it back to people thinking specifically about the context of UCSF and what things look like here. So we have the first, the first two polls. Um, what percent of UCSF faculty are Black or African American? And what percent are Native American or Alaska Native? So you have uh, two sets of questions there. Again, this is anonymous, so it's really just um, kind of thinking through what our perceptions are of, of uh, the makeup of UCSF faculty. We're seeing a lot of responses coming in, so thank you for all of you who are doing the poll. Question is in the poll there as well, Jay. Okay, and then there's, yeah, question number two is, uh, which of the following have you witnessed and or engaged with at UCSF? Um, so those options are exclusion of people with a history of incarceration from job offers, 28% uh, Campus-wide retention efforts for Black and Indigenous students, staff and faculty, 45%. Cronyism in the hiring or promotion process, such as preferential treatment to an associate or friend, 67% have witnessed this. And anonymized job applications. So uh, answer number two and answer number four are, are anti-racist practices that we can engage in as an institution. And answers number one and three in question number two are um, both tend to uh, kind of reinforce existing inequities um, institutionally. So going back to question number one, 50% of you are correct. 3% um, of our faculty at UCSF are Black or African American with um, less than 1% um, being, being Native American or Native Alaskan. So um, very, very low percentages, certainly not reflective of the population of our country. And so um, I'm just gonna ask that people keep reflecting on, you know, what can we do at UCSF to really start to think about anti-racist practices, um, putting those into place, reinforcing those, advocating for those. And we'll get, get back to this at the end of the presentation to start thinking about what we each can do in our own individual spheres of influence um, to really create an anti-racist practice. Um, so I'm going to stop my share so that we can see, um, so that we can see everyone um, and engage in uh, more of a panel discussion um, with the team. And I'm going to ask um, my team a, a few questions and to share their experiences really on the front lines of implementing this research um, with our communities. So the first question is in what ways do you see the difficulties of doing research during COVID intersecting with the difficulties of doing research in the context of systemic racism? So someone from our team want to respond to that first, Ariana? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, you know, um, it's very difficult on this time because uh, for especially for trans Latinas or Latinas, we feel that way, you know, and uh, and the system right now is really bad, you know, and also this is very difficult because the language, 
you know, and, and we don't speak uh, the same language. It's very difficult for for communicate, you know, and especially when girls coming from different countries, from different uh, uh, parts. So, and the racism is the same thing, you know, we feel the same way. Brianna? I think from, from what I've seen is that, yes, this pandemic has highlighted so many problems within community and in research for that we've never seen anything like this in our lives. So when everything shut down, our clients did not shut down because they didn't understand it. They didn't get the information, they didn't get the right messaging, and they were still looking for services to continue. After explaining to them what was actually going on, there was still this growing need for services, community engagement, and resources and money. People were taking things off the shelves, the grocery stores were empty, and in this, seeing everything developed the way that it has and knowing that people couldn't run out and get the things that they need created this divide with the haves and the have-nots. And it was really hard on our clients to talk them through that, to walk them through what was going on, and to walk them through relief fund efforts that not only happened, not di that didn't happen immediately when there was an immediate need. So moving forward, I feel that things need to be communicated and we need to give our clients the technology that they need to be successful when something like this happens again. I was just watching the news this morning and Japan is shutting down again. What if we have to shut down again? How do we reach our clients? What do we, how do we equip them with the technology and the resources that they will need to get through this once again? Thank you, Brianna. Aziza? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I, I want to echo everything um, that Ariana and Brianna have mentioned, and specifically highlight uh, the fact that between COVID and systemic racism, there's a theme of limited or high barriers to access to resources. And given the population that we're working with, predominantly black, trans, Latinx, women of, trans women of color, these intersections and which people work against are economic marginalization and marginalization, educational marginalization, and in, in light of COVID, having to in place out of your house, many of our participants are in the Tenderloin across the Bay Area. Imagine trying to shelter in place while not having a roof over your head, not being able to access the groceries that you need to, in the spaces that you normally frequent because everyone is already hoarding some items. Um, but then also dealing with this racial uprising. We are, in, we are in the midst of a revolution and imagine not being able to be connected to people that you care for and love while being vulnerable to the elements. Like Jay had mentioned earlier, in, in, light, of, in light of this, black folks are still being killed on the street and black trans folks are predominantly affected by these intersecting forces of oppression and so this is all intertwined doing research with marginalized communities just gives us a glimpse at what our communities go through but these folks are living this living through this every day uh, so having systemic racism in research is also is just being amplified and exa and um, 
highlighted by COVID is that's why. Thank you, Z. Uh, anyone else from the team want to respond to that question? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, um, what does liberation mean to you and how can this be applied to our research? Akira, I see the wheels turning. Hi, everybody. Um, well, liberation um, means to me, um, basically not being targeted when when things aren't are, aren't actually uh, things aren't actually um turning out the way that we had anticipated um and also being treated like equally like actually being treated equally um oftentimes like like especially in a lot of like this community type based research even at like other departments like it even at um like dph and whatever so there's like this um there's like this need um, to just like research certain demographics of folks that seem like they're really um, at risk. But um, oftentimes like the research kind of like combs over um, the community and don't necessarily um, offer or even attempt to, to like to, um, to do like um, helpful and meaningful community engagement um, to link participants to actually, you know, make some developmental changes. Um, liberation to me means um, not having to um, wake up in every moment or every day um, protecting myself coming out of the house because I might be targeted for some type of systemic racism or transphobia. Um, in our research, there has to be, you, you are the leaders in this, in this work. You are the leaders. You are the people that um, folk are looking to with the brains. Um, that can help change all of this. Um, in our research, there has to be some types of challenges and push to like advocate for these communities that are often extremely impoverished, um, don't honestly know where their um, where this information lives and how help how it's going to be and if it's going to be helpful um, for the future. Our participants, especially um, with the the research um, that we conduct, um, is our participants offer like literally their blood um and i'm not sure um I, I i could i could we could probably do a poll on how many people actually um would like to just give up their blood just all the time um our community is extremely impoverished and um there's a like a lot of lack of resources for us so um yeah, it'll be, it'll, I honestly, I was hoping that the expectation of this, my expectations of this panel was that we could, you know, um, get some wheels turning for everyone else in terms of challenging the way that we conduct our research. Thank you. I think for me, liberation means to me not to have this discussion. Liberation means we should not be having this discussion about serving people. People should always come first. When we're doing research, when we're in the community, when we're with our friends, we should think of people first, not skin color, not race, not sexual identity, not who someone sleeps with. Liberation means we should not be having these conversations. Liberation to me means we should not be seeing what's going on. In the, in the news. That's what liberation means to me. That we should not be having these conversations around blackness and transness. It should be a given. We shouldn't have to ask for anything. We shouldn't have to ask for what everybody else is just giving. That's what liberation means to me. Give me what I deserve just like everybody else has. Thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you, Akira. 
anyone else want to respond to that question? I think for me, um, liberation means uplifting and supporting my sisters, right? Liberation means being able to have somebody, my, my boss, a trans Latina, um, you know, that liberation means that the power structures would shift, that the PIs would be less white, <laughs> you know, that, that the white PIs would be the minority, um, that we would have project directors and people in actual positions of power within uh, research institutions who look more like the communities that are being researched themselves. I think that so frequently what I see are, um, you know, that the only people who look like the population of focus are the intervention staff. And the intervention staff, the reasons why all of these interventions, any, any intervention that any of us work on are successful is due to the trust that is established by the intervention staff. And that trust some description, you know, that, that, that relationship building event staff and participants is what has created of everyone um, within this division. And those staff are the ones who are the quickest to be let go. The project is done, you know, like the, the PIs then and the statisticians and, um, you know, you know, managers and the project directors all stay on to write the papers. And so all of that is, you know, really contributes to, um, you know, th those, are, those are things that we need to shift, I think, in thinking through how, how is research done and what is it possible for us to shift that that is all stuff that I think we could challenge. You know, like what is the rate of pay for our intervention staff? Why are we privileging education? when you know we know that there are barriers to education that are tied up in the systemic oppression that our communities are facing and so I, I i know that these discussions are being had and i think that we need to push that further thank you luis z liberation to me looks like trust not only on the community level in that the people running the show are part of the people that are being part of the show that there is a conscious effort like louis said to shift the paradigm tear it down start over this doesn't need to be the meta each of us have a role in, in playing into these systems that we've been taught to uh, consider normal and the standard. But standards are always changing. Not long ago, uh, I think less than a century ago, the, the paradigm in medicine was, there was a, a paradigm in medicine called phrenology, which was the study of head shape to, to describe uh, ailments and provide treatment, which we now have obviously debunked. But that used to be the standard, that used to be the gold standard, and that was the lens through which medicine uh, what's the word? Validated, um, validated xenophobia, validated uh, all these isms that we know to be playing out more covertly. And the way in which that's happening now is um, through educational and socioeconomic uh, arms of oppression. How many, how many applications do we fill out, job applications are filled out at UCSD that include a background check and completely dis disregard anyone with a felony or history of a misdemeanor? That completely deny someone of their humanity and ability to uh, reintegrate into society and have access to resources that the system otherwise doesn't want them to have. These are truths, these are evolving truths that are, are mainstream, but 
like we said, these conversations have been going on. These conversations are have been happening for decades by abolitionists, but now is only becoming part of the mainstream because we're now more connected because the pandemic has prevented capitalism from keeping us in, in the terms of going to work every day. Now people are out on the street protesting, also in the midst of the pandemic. So there's this public acknowledgement, this movement, interconnectivity with the internet that is making is putting this under the lens that it needs to be seen, which is the truth. This has been the truth. We all know it as the truth. And the only way in which it can become standard and commonplace is if we practice it as the truth. Anti-oppression is the methodology with which we need to take to tear down the system. And that is an active thing. And the way you talk to people, the way you hire people, the way you educate people, the way you pay people, the way you connect with people. Every move you make is important. The way you put yourself out to the world. If you are going to repost something on social media, write a grant, um, cite people on a paper, having that lens under black, trans, immigrant, houseless, impoverished lens liberation of these community, communities, that is how we will get there. Unless, and if we don't focus on those things, we won't, ha we won't be able to continue this momentum. This isn't a two week protest. This is, this is a cultural paradigm global shift. Thank you so much, Aziza, beautifully said. Um, other folks from the team want to speak to that question? liberation? If I not, we'll... Oh, go ahead, Ariana. I just want to add uh, Well, I think I need to be, to be free, you know, be who I am and accept myself. If I can, I, I, if I don't do this three step, I can help my community, my, mis hermanas, my, my work in the community, you know? So I'm, Thing in liberation for me is to to be who I am, be myself, and is that way I can keep going step by step to work in this part of the community and for everybody, but uh, especially for mis hermanas, my Latinas, and my and, and my trans community. So I think it's very important. If I'm not doing these three steps, I cannot do anything, you know? Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna share um, some calls to action that uh, we kind of came up with as a team. And I think this re these calls to action we're really asking um, everyone, but particularly those of us who are white, who are in positions of power, who you know ha have really navigated this um, you know racist um, white supremacist ideology of academia to be able to um, you know have this type of power and to really reflect on what we can do individually to um, start building a culture of anti-racism in our institutions and to lift up uh, black, trans, and other marginalized um, communities. So the first call to action is to support research that centers black and trans liberation, addressing intersections of structural violence. I think Z spoke to this um, particularly, uh, really thinking about how those intersections of structural violence play out in individual lives. Number two, hire black and brown people as administrators, staff and faculty. Like Luis said, um, not having just the frontline staff um, reflect the communities, but everybody at all levels in our institutions really um, reflect the work that we're, we um, purport to do. Uh, number three, call to action. Abolish culture of anti-blackness. Recognize it when it happens. Abolish it. Build a culture of anti-racism. This is a very proactive, uh, long-term commitment, not just uh, attending a protest, 
um, like was said earlier, this is not a two week protest. This is about really tearing down and rebuilding our culture. Call to action number four, support and secure safety of offsite research. Um, this is, a, is also very personal where, you know, when we're doing research with our communities, we're in the Tenderloin, we're in Soma, we're in Oakland, and um, we all need to feel safe doing the work that we're doing with our communities and not just those of us who have the privilege of operating in, um, you know, lab spaces or able to do our work from the comfort of, of Mission Hall. And number five, uh, as Luis um, uh, shared a link for all of us, is uh, to redistribute your income. So think about these income disparities um, that we've been talking about and the need uh, for people to access very basic resources and think about ways that you can thoughtfully and intentionally um, redistribute your own income and start to rectify some of those disparities. And then we have a final poll for folks um, to uh, and Rochelle, if you want to go ahead and launch it to um, kind of think about our, if any of these are ways that you as, uh, individually might be able to um, leverage some of your individual sphere of power to um, respond to these um, calls to action. And once we finalize this poll, um, we'll open it up for discussion. But um, some of the suggestions in this poll include prioritizing hiring and recommending black, indigenous, and gender diverse faculty and staff, collaboration in, with those communities in grant and paper writing, really pressuring, advocating to administrators and funders to allocate resources toward our communities, and listening to and engaging with research written by black, indigenous, and gender diverse authors before educating colleagues on its relevance to our work. So um, think about what you're able to do as a researcher, as someone engaged in this work, as someone who represents academia, as someone who is seeking to abolish anti-blackness in our institutions. Are any of these things that you can commit to? And it looks like we have really high level of commitment. Um, especially to um, collaboration and listening, which is incredibly important. Great. So, um, so yeah, listening to and collaborating are something all of us can do. Uh, maybe we don't always all have um, the power to hire folks, um, but we can certainly advocate for hiring um, more diverse folks in um, higher level positions, and um, also advocating to funders. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so that we can engage in a broader discussion um, about some of the topics that were raised and hear from some of our audience members about their thoughts and, and their commitments. So feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself to speak. Hi, Jay. It's Susan Kegelis. Hi. Hi. So, um, as you know, and I think Luis knows, I'm doing a project in Peru, and we're working with trans women and um, gay men. And, um, you know, we have the same problem as you guys do here. COVID is really bad in Peru, and it's it's been getting worse, and issues are very serious there. So um, we're middle, in the middle of our intervention, um, and we also have to do data collection, and we've never done anything online. Everything was face-to-face. -face. Um, and similar to folks here, um, you know, the, the populations have, everyone has cell phones in Peru. Um, they may not have um, the best smartphones, um, and, um, and I'm wondering about the issues about being able to get everyone online with Zoom. How did that go? And um, was it actually, uh, could you accomplish it? With, with the cell phones that people have here, was everyone able to get connected via uh, Zoom? Luis? Luis? Um, yeah, as far, so uh, we were, as part of Zoomfo, we were, uh, we're now hosting weekly Friday meetings through Zoom. Um, 
one of the ways not everyone was able to get connected. Not everyone is able to get connected. Oh. I just want to start with that um, due to the barriers that we talked about. So lack of technology and and lack of being able to use the the technology, uh, the technology if, if they have a phone that's able to access them. Uh, that we approached this was making uh visuals for people so we did screen screenshots of what it would look like to download zoom if you had for example an iphone if you had an android and translating those um into spanish so first you're going to start on your home screen and then having us um, a screenshot of that second you're going to go to the app store and um and then addressing things like don't worry it is not this is not when it asks you for your password, it's, it's going to be free of charge. It's not going to charge you. Um, another way that we that that we addressed this was having um, interactions with uh, clients on on Facebook Messenger through the video, and so then they would physically have their phone, and I'd be like, click on the app right there. Okay, now type this on the top, all in Spanish, um, and walking participants through that. Then there is a two step to log on to Zoom. So you have your a meeting ID and in a lot of cases you have a password and so uh, letting pe people sometimes get uh, clients sometimes get used as to what's the meeting ID and what's the password what do I put here what do I put there so really showing people and walking people through that process um, once for clients uh, so a part of also what we've seen um, through these uh, through these um, uh, weekly groups is we see people interacting with each other so sometimes there are multiple participants in the same room um, they're just hanging out um, and so sometimes we will have participants that help each other so someone that's able to, that maybe it's more comfortable with the technology is able to help someone else then log on on their phone and then they're on this in the same room or like a little bit apart and then they're both um, on there separately that's some of the ways that that I have my that I have witnessed. Um, so you were able to do it all remotely, helping them to learn. You didn't have to have anyone come to you. Correct. To, um, and have you ever used, uh, in a lot of other countries, people use WhatsApp. Have you ever used WhatsApp for this kind of thing? Or know that if people can use WhatsApp pretty easily? I guess it's just not used here much. For our specific project, we did use Zoom. Um, Again, it wasn't like everyone was on board and everyone was like, you know, you're it, it, it there are it, the barriers are very real as we stated earlier. But for the people that we were able to log on that are able to log on weekly, those people we were able to help remotely. Yes, do you have a sense of what proportion couldn't do it? Excuse me, do you have a sense of what proportion it just didn't work for at all? Uh, maybe. There, so there's there's really only one person um, who she doesn't have I, I don't think that she has a smartphone um, uh, and she's just not not able she, there's a lot happening with that individual um, but we only know of one person who's absolutely unable to do it and what I will say is that our, our team is following up with her individually at least once a week and we support her with grocery delivery and she is also still checking in with other participants who we have. Um, how to track all of that, I don't know. Our actual um, but for the folks who originally weren't able to join, it was that not with our intervention staff support that we were doing. Um, and uh, we're also going to be doing a like a kind of a health fair for trans latinx folks in you know in the bay area and that is going to be streamed live on facebook and so it's another way to engage mm -hmm. with people to be able to provide in spanish here are all of the resources that are available to us now and to to just stream it live on facebook which people are very familiar with logging in for that and our folks a lot of our folks use whatsapp because it's a great way to communicate internationally thanks, thanks. thank you Other folks have um, questions or anything they want to share? This is Anna Letty. I just wanted to thank everybody on this panel. I thought it was amazing all of your thoughts and perspectives and really eye-opening. Um, and just gave me a lot to think about. And 
I, yeah, I just am really impressed by all the amazing work you're doing. So thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Anyone else? I just want to say, yeah, I, I just also so important. Um, you know, Zia, I really appreciate your theoretical holding of all of this and language and naming of it because I, I think that's right. I mean, I agree. It's, it's a paradigm. I really appreciate the question around liberation. Um, you know, I think that's so. Um, I think that's so important and maybe not as common a word in in research <laughs> in academia. Um, yeah, and I guess I just want to, you know, I don't know where everyone else is with this, but invite, like, you know, this in my kind of field and experience of it, like, this is this is really, really big work. And, you know, I invite, like, myself and, and everyone else to consider what is the kind of support that we'll need individually, emotionally, to do this. Because this is really emotional, psychological, spiritual work that they're asking in these call to action. And I think it's particularly in academia and research, um, you know, we we're taught to sterilize the humanity out of the writing and out of the language. And that's a you know, really important way of how to control the narrative and block out the rage and pain. So just kind of want to invite us all to consider like, yeah, what is the support that we're going to need? It's more accessible that we're not like, I'll get to it. Because I know for me, if I don't make space for the support, I'm not going to make space to think about it and actually step into the action. So important really important reminders, Willie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to my team who I love and adore and just feel really privileged to work with. Thanks to Rochelle for your support. Thanks, Margarita. Thanks, everyone. Yes, a very incredibly powerful and informative um, town hall. Thank you all so much for this excellent town hall. Um, and everyone, please join me in thanking even virtually our panelists. Um, thank you so much. Everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. And panelists, please look at the chat. We won't close it right away. There's just been a lot of great comments there. I think you would wanna look at those. Thank you.